I think that it's something you do after you've done a bunch of other things that you shouldn't have done. And, and I don't see any way out of that argument. It's a position, you find yourself in the position of needing an abortion when you've made a lot of very serious moral errors already. And well, then the question is, well, even if it's wrong fundamentally in that it's not something you would ever recommend that someone do, which I think is a good definition of wrong. Like if, if you can't under any circumstances say that you would recommend something to someone except in sorrow, I can't see how you can think that it's anything but wrong. Then there's the issue of whether it should be left up to individual conscience. And I would say there's enough fractiousness in our society around the issue so that that might be inevitably, that might be necessary inevitably. But then I, what I would do practically is I would float different legislative propositions regarding abortion. Like, it's not that hard to do a compelling poll. It's like, I don't think the majority of Canadians would think that abortions at nine months are a good idea. Like, you can, you can test people's attitudes to find out what policies they would support. The fact that we've been without law surrounding abortion for years because of the judicial decisions is another indication of the abdication of legislative responsibility that's emerged in Canada as a consequence of the, um, the installation of human rights legislation, for example, because what's happening is we're defaulting these decisions to the courts because our politicians don't have enough courage to attack the issues head on. And that's, a, that's a very bad thing. Wow. So I think we should test people about it and find out what, what, where the consensus is. I don't see any other way of approaching it, really. Why do you think we haven't been able to bring a law forward on the issue? Is it just the courage factor, as you just mentioned, or do you think there's something more there? Oh, it's, I think that I think that um, no matter what you say about abortion, you lose. So no politicians are particularly motivated to to you know stick their neck out and be the sacrificial lamb for the for the discussion. But that's not good because. It's the legislative branch that should be handling such things. And I, like I would do it as a social scientist. Essentially, I do it empirically. It's like you can generate 10 different policies and test them publicly and see what people think. You know, I mean, the whole idea in, in the final analysis is that we should turn to the opinion of the majority when we can't decide things. You know, when, when there's complex decisions to be made, we turn to the decision of the majority for better or for worse and let that play itself out in a hopefully self-correcting manner. So I think there are ways that this could be dealt with that would be that would be sensitive to the issues of bodily autonomy on one side and protection for the unborn on the other. And there's issues here like even if you're even if you're an a radical advocate for the pro-abortion position, there are very very complicated issues at play that you have to take into account. So most pro-choice advocates aren't very happy with the sex-selective abortion of females. Right? That, that rubs them logically the wrong way, let's say, as well as ethically. Well, okay, that has, if, if abortion is wrong, if, if abortion is all right under any circumstances, then sex-selective abortion is also all right. But it doesn't seem to be all right. So there's a serious conversation that has to be had about that. And, late-term abortion starts to become indistinguishable from infanticide at some point, and nobody seems to be advocating for infanticide, so that's a real issue. Okay, why do you think Trudeau, um, you know, he really positions himself as a women's rights advocate, right? And why do you think he's not willing to have the gender side conversation? I don't think he's willing to have any hard conversations. I haven't seen any evidence of, of his ability to engage in difficult conversations emerge at all. All I see is someone who's running out a postmodern neo-Marxist ideology. His positions on everything are entirely predictable. And from what I've read, he doesn't really view himself as a leader. He views himself as something like a facilitator or, or, or even as a figurehead. You know, because when I read his descriptions of his roles of prime minister, it sounded to me more like he was describing someone who would be the governor general. So the other issue with, on the abortion side is that, well, if the unborn fetus has no rights whatsoever, then is it okay to imbibe alcohol while you're pregnant or to use cocaine or other addictive drugs? Like, where is there no responsibility whatsoever if you're a mother 
to protect the fetus from the damaging consequences of your own behavior. And you, you can say, no, the mother has full autonomy, but that doesn't help you deal with the child that's born with fetal alcohol syndrome, right? So we have some serious talks to have about such things, but we're not courageous enough, let's say, or maybe we're too polarized to have the sensible, mature discussions that we need to have. Abortion, the abortion issue is a, a fragment of a larger discussion about desirable sexual morality and the role of the state in, let's say, supporting that. But we can't even come out and say, and this is particularly true in places like Ontario, we can't even come out and say, well, the nuclear family that consists of mother, father, and children is the smallest viable family unit, even though the research evidence indicates that absolutely. Clearly, fatherlessness is a complete bloody catastrophe, not only for fathers, but for children and for mothers, because mothers without husbands get poor fast and their children don't do well. So, but, you know, we, we're on the way of this insistence, this idiot egalitarian insistence that all families are equal, for example, which was the mantra of the Ontario Liberals. And there's just, and that's driven by the requirement that you know, two women in a lesbian relationship have to be regarded as parents that are just as viable as the standard nuclear family arrangement. And that may be true in a minority of cases, although we don't know, but as a standard social policy, it just doesn't seem to me to be a tenable solution. So, but we're so far away from being able to have that conversation that it's, that it's uh, a kind of miracle. Yeah, well, well, I so appreciate your talking points and being willing to have this conversation because I think even just having this conversation here opens up opportunity for more conversation and really, really honor your willingness to go into this uh, tough topic with me here. Now, last question. I know our time is just about up here. What would your admonition to the faith community, specifically the Christian community across Canada, be at this moment in light of all that we've talked about today? better stand up for yourself because your your religious rights are very low on the rights totem pole at the moment and that's going to get worse a lot worse before it gets better so if you think that your religious freedom is worth having you better be ready to defend it and you be better be ready to do that in an articulated way because you're not a priority put it that way what would be some practical action points that you would suggest to stick up for ourselves? Well, it's probably it's probably time to vote. It's probably time to take an active role in the political world. I mean, our, our political institutions are quite functional compared to most political institutions. People don't use them, and that's generally because they work so well that you can ignore them. But I don't think we're at a point right now where you can avoid making them political person. And that's a sign that things are destabilized. And so if the traditional types are concerned about preserving what they have and, and also having the right to continue to engage in their faith-based activity and beliefs, then they better take a good hard look at the people who are opposing that and decide what they're going to do about it. You know, the other, partly what I've been trying to do is to point out the psychological utility of some of these more traditional beliefs, especially the, the say, the corpus of Judeo-Christian beliefs. I think we need a revamping of our understanding of the relationship between fundamental religious presuppositions of our society and our political and economic institutions. I think we need to understand how they're related more fundamentally because I see the entire doctrine of individual sovereignty and individual rights as a logical extension of the, of the Judeo-Christian notion that there's a spark of divinity that characterizes each individual person and that we're made in the image of God. That's the metaphysical presupposition. I think those metaphysical presuppositions are unbelievably important and primary. And so I would say also for the faith-based types, it's time to take a leap forward.
And to all the viewers out there today, thank you so much for joining us. And I hope this conversation has been insightful and enlightening for you. If it has been, please consider sharing these clips with your family and friends. And also consider subscribing to our YouTube channel so you can get instant notifications when we post other clips in the future. You can also check us out online at fateen.tv. 